Good morning. Welcome to Church Without Religion. My name's Andrew Farley, and we are in our series called Inspire today, looking at the power of God's love. Let's open with a word of prayer together. Father, thank you for today. We just ask that by your word and by your spirit that you would show us the truth about your love, that your face is always toward us, that your love is good and healthy for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Inspire the power of God's love. You know, we've been talking about a dangerous message. The danger of believing that you're totally forgiven. The danger of believing that you're living under God's grace. Is it dangerous? And we've said, indeed it is, but only, only for the enemy. For us, it is a very safe message to believe in the love and the grace and the forgiveness of God. And yet this morning, we need to delve a little deeper and look at this simple question. Is the message of God's unconditional love, His agape love for us, is it too dangerous to believe? Well, first, we need to see that there is absolutely no question that God loves us. We read in Romans chapter 5, it says, God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We want to feel God's love. We look for God's love out there. We try to spell love with our circumstances, it's a lot like reading the tea leaves, as they say. We're connecting the dots. We're looking to how things are going in our job, in our family, in our marriage, with our friends. We're looking at circumstances externally to try to find the love of God. And Romans 5 tells us, don't do that. Watch out for that trap. Planet Earth will not spell love to you. It is God demonstrating His love in the work of Jesus Christ that actually shows us how big, how great this love is that God has lavished upon us. So look to the cross. Look to the resurrection. Look to Christ in you. Look to the powerful presence of God in your life as indication of his love. How does God spell love? He spells love time spent. And he has decided to spend time with you now and into eternity. A permanent presence, a bond, a fusion of his life with your life so that you have become one spirit with him. You know, as a father, I can tell you that what my son desires from me is time spent. I can tell him that I love him. I can say nice things to him in passing in the hallway of our home or driving him to school in the morning or picking him up in the afternoon. I can say, son, I love you. But nothing demonstrates that love more than time spent. When we go on a ski trip together, when we go play nine holes of golf together, when we shoot baskets out in the parking lot, whatever it might be, that time spent, it spells love to him. And God has done something permanent and powerful to spell love to us. It is his presence with us and in us no matter what, as he says, I'll never leave you. Now that is some serious love. Revelation chapter 1 shows us another way that God has demonstrated his incredible love. It says, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. You know, that's one of the biggest things that you can do for another person is to forgive them. As you have found in your life, I'm sure it's an incredible gift to be released, to be released from a debt. 
And so you think about the debts that you've carried, your college debt, your graduate school debt perhaps, debt on a home, a mortgage. And the moment that you're able to be released from that debt, what an incredible relief that is. Maybe you remember a time when you got your car paid off, got your home paid off, or got a credit card debt completely wiped out. What an incredible relief that was to you that day. Maybe you'll never forget it. Well, God has done something in His love for us. He has released us from the debt that we owed Him. A debt we could never pay anyway, but He's released us from our sins. God demonstrates His love for us in that. A total wipe away, a total take away of our sins once and for all. 1 John chapter 3 says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Notice another way in which God has demonstrated His incredible love to us by calling us His kids. And John, the Apostle John here, he has to almost pause to get his breath back. He says, and such we are. This little phrase kind of shows you the enthusiasm of the Apostle John. God has loved him so much that John is now God's kid. And for us to recognize that we are not slaves, we're kids. We're not servants, we're children. And as we recognize that connection, that family line, that lineage, that heritage, we see even more of God's incredible love for us. Romans chapter 5 says, And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So God is not just up in heaven loving us long distance. It's one thing to have a long distance relationship. Maybe you remember a time in your life, maybe went back when you were dating someone, it was a long distance relationship. Or perhaps for some reason your spouse had to be away for a while. And so you had to engage in a long distance relationship for a period of weeks or months I mean, it's okay, it's tolerable, it's good, but it's not great. And so there you are by phone back in the day, watching your minutes, making phone calls long distance to remain connected with this person that you love. Well, the relationship that we have with God is not long distance. It is local. In fact, it is so local because Christ is in you and you are in Christ. We are not firing up prayers to heaven hoping that God might hear us, hoping that they don't bounce off the ceiling and that they make it all the way to the pearly gates. No, even when we pray, we are talking to a God who is local, who lives inside of us, us in Him and Him in us. Now, I want you to notice one more thing about this passage, Romans 5. It says the love of God has been poured where? Poured in our hearts. Now, what does that say about your heart? See, God doesn't live in dirty places. As I always love to say, he cleaned house and then he moved in. He purified your heart and then he poured his love in your heart. I remember when I was a little kid, we would have a break at church, a break between the Sunday school for youth and then the main service. And I would go down the street to this convenience store and we would get a, a bottle of Coke or a bottle of Pepsi. And uh, we would collect these bottles. I mean, over a week and a month and a year, you would have a lot of bottles laying around if you just let them collect. But they had a system. This store had a system. They were willing to buy the bottle back. And, you know, you call that redemption. That's what redemption is, a buying back. 
Now, why would this little convenience store known as the IGA back in the early 80s, why would the IGA store buy my bottle back? Well, what they would do next is they would sterilize those bottles. They would purify those bottles. And then, you guessed it, at the factory, at the Coca-Cola factory or the Pepsi factory or the Royal Crown. Remember RC? Even at the RC factory, they would do the same. They would sterilize these bottles and then they would fill them and then they would put a cap on top sealing them. Well, that is exactly what salvation is. Salvation is a sterilizing, a purifying, a cleansing, a filling, and a sealing with God's Holy Spirit. And so that's what we see here. We see a little window into what salvation is in Romans 5. The love of God poured out, just like into those bottles, poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This is not imputed, it's imparted. Imputed means it's counted as if. It's counted like it's in a bank account. No, this is righteousness not just imputed, but imparted, poured in, shared with us. And so we get righteousness and life imparted through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit into our spirit as we are sealed with Him until the day of redemption. Well, Paul goes on to talk about this amazing love of God. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Do you think tribulation, problems you encounter? Do you think distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Things like war and violence and, and people dragging you from your homes. He says, no, in all these things... We overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. What does that tell you about the love of God? He says, I'll never let you go. I don't care what you're going through. I will never let you go. Paul goes on. He says, for I am convinced. I guess that leaves us with a personal question. Are you convinced? He says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow! I mean, seriously. I have had people love me and I have had people like me, and I have had people befriend me, but nothing, nothing like this. This is rock solid, unshakable, unbreakable, a promise, not just for this life, but for the life to come. And we're worried about the final judgment. And he says, nothing will separate you. And we're worried about our many sins. And he says, nothing will separate you. And we're worried that he might be ticked off at us. And he says, nothing will separate you. We need to grow accustomed to this incredible flavor of love. It is like nothing on the planet. Agape love. God's no strings attached love. God saying, I will love you no matter what. Now, is this dangerous? I mean, is this kind of love and embrace, this kind of acceptance, this kind of, of love that God has demonstrated toward us, which we've seen so clearly, has no conditions to it. He'll never let us go. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Nothing can separate us. So isn't that dangerous? Well, again, we're going to find it's dangerous, but only, only to the enemy. Because this kind of love is actually the core and the key to the Christian life. This kind of love is the inspiration for every move that we make 
in Jesus Christ. So if you've been wondering how to get motivated, if you've been wondering how to find inspiration, if you found yourself dragging your feet in life, if you found yourself looking for something, let me tell you that something is the love of God. The incredible love of Jesus Christ, it motivates and inspires and uplifts every single time. First, we see God's love inspires godliness. I don't know if people really believe this. I know that we can say this sort of thing on Sunday morning. It's time for church. It's time for a pep talk. It's time to talk about the goodness of God. But come Monday and come Wednesday and come Friday, I'm just not sure how many believers actually buy into the idea that it is safe to walk in perfect love. That unconditional love is not scary. That unconditional love is not risky. That unconditional love is a trustworthy motivator, a trustworthy way to live. You know, I I get all kinds of emails You know that. I often share some of my emails, some of the pushback, some of the resistance to the message of God's grace. And essentially, people are freaking out. They're saying, you're saying God loves us this much, and I get it, but, I get it, but, if that's all you say, if that's all you preach, If that's all you teach, if you don't put in the part that creates the motivation, then they're not getting the whole message. And so what they're saying is that we need love plus. We need grace plus. We need forgiveness plus. We need the goodness of God plus something else to motivate people. What we're going to see today is that the Scripture does not back that up. His grace is sufficient for us. We are going to find that God's love and grace and forgiveness and kindness and goodness is the only motivator that we need for upright living. God's love inspires godliness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at what it says. I love this line. The love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. God, I want to I live for you. I want to be your guy. I want to be your right-hand man. I was 19 years old praying prayers, something like that. And my desire was to be used by God. My desire was to reach people with the gospel. And yet, I went about it all the wrong way. I was trying to show God my love for Him instead of taking in His love for me. I was trying to live for God and serve God and be good for God and and maintain something with God through what I was doing instead of being willing to be a receiver, a recipient, a reflector of who God is to me. I was trying to produce rather than receive. I was trying to put out instead of allowing input from God. And so we see here, Paul is showing us the divine order of things, isn't he? The love of Christ controls us. What does that mean? Well, it means you got to know how loved you are, for starters. If you don't know how loved you are, if you don't know the love of Christ, then that love can't control you. And so we need to let the love of Christ, inspire and motivate and control us. Does that mean that we're like robots and God has the remote? That God is controlling us, telling us move left, move right? Are we spiritual androids controlled by God? No, the verbiage here has to do again with the idea 
of being inspired by something that wells up within you. Something welling up within you that permeates, permeates your thinking, permeates your attitudes, permeates your choices. Let the love of Christ permeate all that you are and all that you do. Well, there is no greater passage on love than 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You're very familiar with it, I'm sure. But I want to just take a few minutes here to examine it in light of the idea that too much love sounds dangerous. Too much unconditional love will make people sin more. Look at Paul's words. He says the opposite. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. God, I want to be more patient. God, I wish I was kinder to people. God, I want to be able to endure the difficulties that come my way. Again, do you see what the key is? The key is knowing God's love. I know what we've done with this passage. We have massacred this passage in many regards as we get out our notebook and take notes on 1 Corinthians 13 love and try to do it, try to do it just right. Got to be patient, got to be kind, got to endure all things, got to, got to, got to, and we're trying to produce this. Do you realize that love is not a verb in this passage? Love is not a do verb in this passage. Love is a noun. You know what a noun is? A noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. Love is something or someone. In this passage, he is saying that if we don't have love, if we don't possess the noun, if we don't possess the something, if we don't possess the someone, well, then nothing else matters. We're like a, a noisy gong, just making a bunch of noise but there's no love behind it. And so, is love dangerous? The word here is agape, is unconditional, no strings attached to love. Here, is it dangerous? Quite the opposite. What do we see? The love of God, the agape love of God, once you possess Him, He starts to motivate within you the idea of patience, Patience is not something you work on. I know since you were this high in church, you heard the idea that you need to be patient and you work on your patience and you count to 10 for your patience and you read books on patience and you work at these attributes and you got to be like Christ. You got to be like Jesus. And so we start one, at, one attribute at a time. We call it the fruits of the Spirit instead of the fruit. And we start working on the fruits. I got to work on my fruits this week. What fruit are you working on? Well, I'm working on peace this week. And next week, I'm going to work on patience. I'm working on my fruits. Well, you sound like a fruit. <laughs> you don't work on the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And when you possess, 1 Corinthians 13, when we possess agape love, who is Jesus, then He is patient. He is kind. I would encourage you sometime to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and every time you see the word love, put in the word Jesus. Because see, God is love. And it's not about doing love here. It's about possessing love or possessing the one who is love. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's about possessing the Spirit and letting the Spirit bear fruit, whatever that might look like in a given moment. You can't predict it. Maybe the flesh 
in the, according to the flesh, you're trying to work on patience. It's not time for patience. It's time for action. You're saying you need to work over here, work on peace. It may not be time for peace. It may be time to voice a thought, an opinion, a heartfelt idea that the Lord has given you. You're working on individual attributes, but the attributes are owned by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ lives in you. And our job is not to imitate attributes, but to let Jesus be Jesus in every moment, whatever He looks like. That's why we do not pursue the fruits. We pursue life according to the Spirit, walking in step with Him. 1 Peter chapter 4, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Does that sound dangerous? Too much love. Got to watch out for that love message. Now, don't you let yourself be loved too much, or you'll end up sinning more. Well, remember, remember what we discover in the Scripture time and time again. It is forgiveness and grace and love that are the inspirations, the motivators in the Christian life. And here we see no exception. Love covers a multitude of sins. Man, I'm struggling with this. Man, I'm struggling with, you know, the way that I respond to him, the way that I react to her, the way that I treat my kids sometimes, the way that I blow up at my boss sometimes. I'm struggling with a multitude of sinful reactions and responses, and I don't know. Love. Love. Trust Jesus to be love in you in those moments, whatever that may look like. Love covers a multitude of sins. The love of God is the answer, not the problem. Ephesians 3, Paul says, Know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. That's how big it is. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. This is the passage where Paul is explaining what it means to be being filled with the Spirit. To be motivated and inspired by God's Spirit. And you know what he says the key to be being filled with the Spirit is? He says it's knowing God's love. If you're going to focus on one thing in the Christian life, focus on the love of Christ. It is the best focus any believer can have. To know the love of Christ, the height of it, the depth of it, the width of it, the breadth of it, to know how amazing Christ's love is, that is what causes us to be filled up with a new motivation, to be inspired, to be welling up inside with an incredible new motivation, God's love for us. Spilling over into the lives of other people, but it starts with being a receiver. God's love is dangerous, but only, only for the enemy. Next, we see that God's love inspires unity. Unity between each other in the congregation, in a church, in the body of believers. God's love inspires unity. Romans chapter 15. I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. We were recently in a Bible study talking about prayer. How do you pray? People tend to pray in all kinds of ways. Some people have memorized prayers, wrote prayers, repeated prayers, King James English prayers. We were talking all about that and how silly that can get and how we're free to be ourselves And here we see Paul mentioning prayer. It's prayer for him. It's prayer for a messenger. And he says, let the love of the Spirit be your inspiration. The love of the Spirit. How often do you think about the fact that the Holy Spirit loves you? I'll tell you, growing up, I was scared to death of the Holy Spirit. Man, I was all for Jesus, but I was scared to death of the Holy Spirit. Why? Why? Well, I mean, Jesus died for my sins. 
Jesus hung on a cross for me. Jesus paid the price big time for me. How compassionate and kind is Jesus. But the Holy Spirit, all I heard is he's here to convict you. He's going to convict you of all your sins all the time. And so I imagined, well, here's Jesus, the love of my life. And then here's the Holy Spirit, the disciplinarian. <laughs> Look at this. The love of the Spirit is the motivator to strive together and to pray for one another. The love of the Spirit. Not just the love of Jesus. Not just the love of the Father. But the love of of the Holy Spirit. Can you not see it? The entire Trinity is pleased to have you. The entire Trinity is in love with you. And if God, the Godhead, three in one, if they are for you, then who in the world can be against you? Galatians chapter 5 continues this love motivation for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, notice that it's through love, serve one another. So I want to serve. I want to serve other people, Lord. I want to serve you. Well, here's the way, through love. How do you serve through love? Well, you got to be receiving love and you got to be a transmitter of love. You got to be a recipient of love. You got to be soaking in God's love. I love hot tubs. I'm talking jacuzzis. I'm saying that wherever I travel, I try to make sure in advance that whatever hotel I need to stay in, that they've got one that has a hot tub. And sometimes I'll call. I'll call ahead because... Five, ten times I've booked a hotel and the hot tub is not working. So if I'm going to spend $100 on a hotel, I'm going to make sure they've got a hot tub, an indoor hot tub in the cold weather, and that it's functional this week. That's how much I love hot tubs. Why? Man, I love to soak, and after I've taught at a conference for four or seven or eight sessions, my feet start to hurt and I'm sore, and I'm feeling it, I'm exhausted, and I get into that hot tub, and I'm telling you, it does a number on me, and I am ready to teach again. It's refreshing, it's invigorating, it's soothing, it's healing, and so is the incredible love of God. But you know, you gotta, you gotta soak in it. I don't, at that hotel, I don't run around trying to tell people, hey, you got to get in here. And I don't splash people in the hallways of that hotel with hot water, trying to get them to experience it. I'm not concerned with giving to other people at that moment. I'm not trying to get everybody in the hotel to experience what I'm experiencing. Sometimes you just have to settle in and receive. Sometimes you just got to soak and we call that selfish, and we're not willing to do it. And, you know, all of these religious messages throughout the ages have made us feel guilty about receiving the love and grace of God, as if we can have too much of it. But the truth is, is we need to soak. We need to take a good, long soak in the incredible love of Christ. And that is what motivates us to serve through love. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You want to be unified? Start with the love of Christ. God's love inspires confidence. We read in 1 John, By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. So does it sound like God's love is dangerous there? No, God's love pushes us to a place of confidence where we're calling out to God, 
calling him Abba Father, recognizing we don't have to be scared of the end times. We don't have to be scared of judgment. We don't have to be scared of punishment. We don't have to be scared about whether we're a sheep or a goat. We can know his voice. We can know his attitude of love toward us. And perfect love just pushes out that fear. And here comes the confidence. You can be unbelievably sure that you will not experience an ounce of judgment for your sins, an ounce of punishment for your sins, because Jesus Christ took it all. Lastly, we see in 1 John, the same epistle, God's love inspires our love of other people. We'll finish with this. You know it. You've seen it. You've read it. Maybe you've got it memorized, but here it is. We love because He first loved us. Are you willing to believe this? Are you willing to soak? Are you willing to receive? Are you willing to rest in the incredible love of God we must receive in order to transmit? The only reason that we love is because God first loved us. Is this love dangerous? Does it sound dangerous to you? Love inspires. Love motivates. Love controls. Love drives us toward godly living. That's what agape love does every single time. Conclusion, God's love inspires godliness. God's love inspires unity. God's love inspires confidence before Him. And God's love inspires love of other people. We desperately need to know and to celebrate God's amazing love for us. God's love is not dangerous to us. God's love is essential to our lives. Friend, are you willing today, are you willing to live loved? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love, for your grace, for your forgiveness. We will not apologize for our belief in your agape love. We will not tone it back. We will not balance it. We will not temper it. We're going all the way believing that you are who you say you are and that your promise is good. You never will leave us. You never will forsake us. Nothing can ever separate us from your incredible love. You love us. You like us. You embrace us. You're for us. Father, we thank you that this is not a feel-good message. This is a feel-great message. We thank you that we have permission to feel great inside because of your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.